I'm Kristen Oaks White and I'm Avery Davidson. Thank you for joining us for This Week in Louisiana Agriculture, the only TV show bringing Louisiana farmers and consumers together every week. Fears over COVID-19, also known as the coronavirus, continue to plague the markets. Sharp downturns have not only affected the stock exchange, but the ag markets as well. Well, the virus is not the only cause, though. A recent failed deal between Russia and OPEC nations to stop the glut of oil production has caused oil prices to plummet, taking ag products down with them. The relationship between ag and oil is hand in hand and quite complicated. Corn prices are affected because as oil prices go down, so does ethanol demand. Corn is used to make ethanol. It's also affected soybeans as they're used in biodiesel. Biodiesel is getting a double whammy as tankers, grain and cruise ships all utilize it. Greg Fox, a grain marketing specialist with the Louisiana Farm Bureau, says if Russia is not brought back to the negotiating table, the glut of oil could affect grain long after the virus is gone. As far as for the corn side, uh, the ethanol is impacted because gasoline prices, unleaded gas. You're seeing negative margins on the corn, on the ethanol side, because corn prices are still relatively high compared to fuel prices. They're seeing a negative impact. We'll definitely be keeping an eye on this situation, and hopefully for our farmers, we'll see some good news soon. While there is little doubt that the coronavirus is having an impact on cattle markets, in fact, feeder cattle prices dropped $4.50 last Friday. While price is something out of most Louisiana cattle ranchers' control, what they can do is learn to make their practices more efficient and sustainable. That's why a group of Louisiana ranchers went to Florida to visit ranches there, some that have been around for six generations. Welcome to Adams Ranch in Fort Pierce, Florida. Located about 20 miles from the Atlantic coast, this land is home to more than 7,500 head of cattle. It's also the birthplace of the Brayford cattle breed, officially recognized in 1969. So this is the foundation herd of the Brayford breed in the United States. Mike Adams is the president of Adams Ranch. Established in 1937, Adams is the third generation working cattle here. He's proud to have the Louisiana Farm Bureau Livestock Advisory Committee Beef Tour visit his ranch. Farm Bureau has been a great voice for agriculture and, uh, you know, it's possible we wouldn't be here with it without Farm Bureau. Walter Smith raises cattle in Washington Parish, Louisiana. Looking at these cattle grazing among cabbage palm trees, Smith says he's impressed. I think uh, Mr. Adams and his family have done a tremendous job in, in selecting animals, keeping them true to the breed, and breeding better animals with better bulls throughout the past uh, probably 80 to 90 years. They've been here quite a while. North of the Adams Ranch is Kempfer Cattle Company. It's here where the group gets to see purebred registered Brahmin cattle. For Caddo Parish rancher Carrie Rumbaugh, the entire visit is quite the experience. We got to ride on swamp buggies, which I had never done before. We got to see um, registered herds, and that is new to me. We do not have registered herds at our house. And um, they have many different breeds. They had Brahma, Shorthorn, Angus, and Charlet. And so it's nice to see a different mix of all the different breeds. George Kempfer represents the sixth generation to work the nearly 4,000 head of cattle here. But on this land, his family does much more, including timber, sod, and even harvesting the palm trees you see in the pastures. You don't always want to be the first to try something new, but you don't, if it's working, you sure as hell don't want to be last. Kempfer says he enjoys sharing what his family does so others can learn just the way he did. So many things we do here, we didn't come up with ourselves. I take ideas of what other ranches are doing from around the country, whether it's from being on their ranch or reading it in a magazine article or whatever through university, just research deals, always trying to do things better or find ways to do things better. And the biggest way we've gotten ideas or different management tech skills is from learning it from visiting other ranches. So we've kind of opened ourselves up to allow people to come and do that. Whenever you do stuff on your operation every day, you kind of get into a routine. And so it's nice to break up the monotony sometimes and see what other people are doing. Marty Woldridge helped organize this trip. He says visiting places like the Adams Ranch and Kempfer Cattle Company 
Make the Louisiana Farm Bureau Livestock Advisory Committee beef tour something worth doing every year. The dedication that these multi-generation farms are putting into their operations to make sure that the farm is here for the next generation or the, the ranch is here for the next generation, be it from the way they're protecting the water and making great use of the, the water that they have, uh, to being the, the way that they are protecting their image for the 22 million people living in this state. The Louisiana Farm Bureau Livestock Advisory Committee is already planning its next tour next year. They're talking about going back to Florida, northern Florida, and south Georgia. So we're looking forward to see how that comes out. Next week, we're going to probably take a look at some of the research that's done. Was it a good trip? It was a good trip. We had a good time. It learned a lot. Looked like y'all went to a lot of great places. It was a lot of fun. A half century of service is about to come to an end. Ronnie Anderson, president of the Louisiana Farm Bureau, says he will retire this June. He's led the state's largest general farm organization for the past 31 years, and that was after he had already served for 20 years on the parish and state level. He's made quite an impact in all that time, growing membership, expanding programs, and advocating for Louisiana agriculture and rural life at both the state and national levels. In fact, this week, Louisiana Senator John Kennedy honored Anderson for his years of service. He has devoted those years in large part to service to our state's Farm Bureau. He has led the Louisiana Farm Bureau to greater influence, to growing membership, and that's not a small feat because uh, America was born on a farm. In some respects, Louisiana was born on a farm, and farming is, is as you well know, uh, Madam President, is, is a challenging, yet a very rewarding vocation and profession. On the House side, 5th District Congressman Dr. Ralph Abraham also took time to recognize Anderson for his time serving Farm Bureau. Abraham says Anderson has been a great resource during his time in office. I've known Ronnie personally for many, many years as a farmer myself, and it's always been clear to me that he loves Louisiana agriculture. When I was elected to Congress, I came to rely on his counsel to advocate for our farmers and ranchers. Following his retirement, Anderson will remain an ex officio member of the board for one year. He may be retiring, but Ronnie Anderson is still a very busy man. Oh, yeah, still going all over the place. Last week, he helped host the USDA Undersecretary of Agriculture, Steve Sinsky, who was in New Orleans with a delegation of farmers who were there to meet with him, and our cameras were there, too. We got to listen to some of the most important topics being discussed in Louisiana agriculture right now. We've got the Undersecretary of Agriculture. Secretary Sinsky is here, and he's visiting with different commodities in the state, talking about all the issues that are affecting us, implementation of the Farm Bill, trade uh, negotiations that are going on, the impact that we're having from that. A lot of uh, new issues that are coming up that uh, uh, we're going to have to face. Coronavirus is one thing, and how that might affect trade with China and, and other uh, trade avenues that we're doing. but. Uh, we got a good cross section of people from, well, Farm Bureau people, Ag Center people, the Department of Agriculture folks are here. The different commodities, cotton, rice, sugar, uh, all the different uh, commodities in the state are, are represented here. And we got a, a good group of folks to talk to him. There's lots of people, some probably in this room, who may not even be a business without the MFP payments. Uh, we understand the trade situation with China, we understand the, the president's motives. Uh, at the same time, you can only go for so long paying your bills for patriotism. So those MFP payments were uh, very, very needed. Uh, we just need to see demand. We need to see demand for these commodities, and we need to see better prices. Otherwise, if we don't, I mean, we're just continually living off of uh, government support because prices where they've been are just not sustainable in the long term. Because not only do we have the depressed prices we've had lately, but we also have the weather disasters that have happened. Whether you had a hurricane or not come through in 18, I mean, we didn't have a hurricane in, in uh, Northwest Louisiana, but we had months and months of rain and I wound up losing half my soybean crop. We didn't harvest it. Uh, so that hurts. Um, and seeing that, I mean, I've heard that uh, they expanded WIP Plus to include excessive moisture, which is, hopefully this would turn out to be a, another, another step on Recovery. And right now, I mean, with uh, we're still very optimistic and very hopeful that we will see that increased trade. And we know that farmers want trade and not aid. 
uh, and uh, with China uh, phase one deal, uh, you know, China, as we believe, is going to be making very large purchases. They've just announced some tariff exemptions that we think that we're going to see that picking up. And uh, again, you know, I think it's if we don't see the trade pick up, that was that's when the president said if the farmers need that kind of assistance, he's going to be behind them. Secretary uh, has been very clear that we're hoping that farmers shouldn't plan on that because we're still expecting big things to come from China, from Japan, from Mexico and Canada, and so we don't think any kind of assistance will be needed. We're monitoring that closely. Obviously, the coronavirus is affecting uh, our agriculture exports, uh, you know, China's ability to import at the ports right now. We hope that that's going to get straightened out soon and we're going to see a big bump up. But we're monitoring it closely and I would say, you know, any kind of decision wouldn't be made until late, later this summer, late into the summer. Sinsky grew up on a grain farm in Minnesota and was the CEO of the American Soybean Association for 21 years. Still to come on Twyla, we're going to our other studio that's over there, the podcast studio, to talk podcasts. But first, we see the president pardon a turkey every November, but in Louisiana, we have our own pardon to hand out. Lieutenant Governor Billy Nungesser recently pardoned one lucky crawfish on the campus of my alma mater, the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Now this has become a yearly tradition that takes place the first Tuesday after Mardi Gras. Emile is the crawfish of honor and he's named after ULL graduate J. Emile Verrett, who was Louisiana's Lieutenant Governor from 1944 to 1948. This unique event celebrates the early days of crawfish season and lets us all know it's time to seek out all these delicious crustaceans, not just a meal. <laughs> Today, the Lieutenant Governor is uh, freeing a crawfish uh, as kind of a token of the beginning of crawfish season in Louisiana, which is always scheduled uh, to be the first Tuesday after Mardi Gras. We are doing the pardoning of the crawfish, kind of like the pardoning of the turkey that the President does every Thanksgiving. crawfish was to come to Miss UL's campus and upstage me. So I'm wearing crawfish red today in honor of Mr. Crawfish today. I've been able to do so many amazing things, especially this. Like I get to be here for the actual parting of the crawfish. How exciting is that? We're here in the Lafayette campus about to pardon uh, one lucky crawfish uh, while the rest of his family gets boiled alive. Uh, great opportunity for us to highlight and kick off crawfish season here in Louisiana. Um, an industry that continues to grow and get recognition around the world. So this gives us a little extra flavor to crawfish season. Crawfish is, is a staple uh, food product, particularly in the spring and uh, during the Lenten season. People love it. You can cook it in a variety of different ways. Uh, and once, uh, once newcomers learn how to peel, they never stop. Nothing pulls people together in South Louisiana like a crawfish boil. But it's nice to know that folks will gather for a fortunate crustacean who gets off the hook as well. As president of the Lieutenant Governor Association, I was invited to the White House. And it was right about the time they were bragging on pardoning a turkey. And so we came back home and put our heads together and said, well, if they can pardon a turkey, we surely can pardon a crawfish. It's, it's part of our culture. It's unique. It's interesting. It's fun. Uh, people like to celebrate. They love crawfish. Aquaculture and agriculture are such an important part of our economy. So it, 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 it all fits together. And whereas Louisiana recognizes that a turkey shouldn't be the only animal to get a second chance. <laughs> and whereas the Tuesday after Mardi Gras is officially known as the party of the crawfish day in Louisiana. And whereas Emile the crawfish has been selected from the other brave crawfish who will meet their fate with courage and sacrifice. <laughs> and whereas Emile shall be saved from the fate of being served in any boil, etouffee, po' boy, or dish imagined by any chef or Cajun and shall be free from water any hotter than what is found in the beautiful swamps and bayous of Louisiana. 
Neil is going to be released uh, to his freedom in, in uh, Palmetto State Park down by Abbeville. Uh, he's going to have a great time living his life for a whole year and while all his family gets boiled. Good for Emil. Congratulations. I try to eat crawfish as much as I possibly can and at our crawfish festival we serve plenty of different kinds of crawfish like boiled, etouffee. My favorite is I, I like them all. <laughs> My favorite crawfish dish is boiled with jalapenos and very spicy. Come here and try our crawfish. We have the best. No questions about it. Really good. Very spicy. It's great. <laughs> good. <laughs> now that's one lucky crawfish. I hope he's wearing his name tag in his new dig. Well, they took him somewhere else. They could have let him go right there in Cajun Swamp. He'd have been living it up in the new student union, going down to the quad, hanging out. Not that anyone I know ever did that. He's in dangerous territory in Acadiana, <laughs> I'm telling you. Well, a mild winter helped get this year's crawfish season off to an early start. However, as Twyla's Craig Gotro shows us, while the catch has been good, the crawfish are running just a bit smaller for this time of year. The Linton season has arrived, which usually coincides with a greater demand for Louisiana crawfish. Mild winter weather allowed producers to start harvesting early this year. Farmers are seeing a large quantity of crawfish in their fields, and they are hoping the quality increases. I think the size is a little bit behind what it normally is at this time of the year, uh, and quarantine probably a little bit ahead, so we're hoping they, they catch up. Because demand was weak and the catch was strong, producers feared that prices would fall fast and they would be limited at how often they could fish. Fontenot has been affected by the price, but he has been able to fish consistently. We haven't uh, had to park the boats very much, you know, so we've, we've been push, fishing six days a week. Pretty steady. Because of the large number of small crawfish, crawfish processors also got an early start. Crawfish tail meat is sold by the pound and is a key ingredient to many crawfish dishes. I think in most cases peelers came in early. They got their, uh, their people who peel come in a little earlier than normal to get started. Processors prefer the smaller crawfish, while growers want the larger crawfish for the live market because they fetch the farmer a much better price. The difference between peelers and what they're calling field run um, it's around a dollar, dollar to a dollar twenty-five difference a pound. How long consumers will be able to get fresh crawfish will be determined by two factors. We'd like to get into the middle of June. You know, that's our goal, and, and obviously the, the, the crawfish and, and price dictate when we're going to stop. Depressed rice prices have made many rice farmers more reliant on crawfish to sustain their farming operations. With the LSU Ag Center, this is Craig Gotro reporting. Well, they may be smaller, but Avery, people want to know mm -hmm. how much are those crawfish going to cost you? And checking in with prices from around the state, we are seeing a drop in prices, and they seem to be getting better as the weather gets warmer. The St. Patrick's Day parades this weekend in New Orleans may be canceled, but you can still go out and enjoy some crawfish. At Dini's Seafood Market in the New Orleans area, you can get them live for $2.99 a pound or boiled, not much more, at $3.85 a pound. In Baton Rouge, Tony's Seafood has them for $3.69 a pound, live and $1.20 more. You can get them boiled for $4.89. Finally, you can get good crawfish in grocery stores too. Brookshire's in Shreveport has them for $2.79 a pound live and $3.99 a pound for boiled crawfish. And as always, please call or use the crawfish app on your phone to check the prices. It's great because you can search by city, vendor, and even how close the nearest place is to you. And hey, if you know a farmer, that's the best place to get them. These prices are brought to you by the Louisiana Crawfish Promotion and Resource Research Board, reminding you to make sure it's Louisiana crawfish. Ask before you eat. Still to come on Twyla, with all the news of coronavirus, this week's boost will lift your spirits, and it has nothing at all to do with COVID-19. Nothing. But first, we catch you up on all the podcasts we've been working on here at Louisiana Farm Bureau lately. Stay with us. If you've been around here over the last year, you've likely heard us talk a lot about podcasts, and that's because they're a fun new way to tell farmer stories. I think they're Carl Wigger's favorite word. And I'm actually going to go ahead and I'm going to show you a little bit of what we're doing. So please excuse me for just a moment, Kristen. Okay. I'm going to walk off set because this is what we do 
every week whenever we finish up shooting this week in Louisiana agriculture. We come to our second studio. This one right here, which has nice soundproofed walls and wonderful microphones. And this is where we sort of do what we do anyway. And when I say we, I'm talking about me, Kristen Oaks White, Carl Wiggers, and Neil Melanson. After we're done shooting the show, we used to just sit around and talk about our stories and all the stuff that we couldn't put on the air. We talked about it over in another room or just sitting in the edit room. So we thought, why not record it and make that the Twyla After Show? Now, that's not the only podcast we're doing. We just started off a new podcast specifically for the Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation, and that is Grassroots Government. That's where me, Carl Wiggers, LFBF Legislative Specialist Joe Mapes, and Andy Brown, our National Affairs Coordinator, get together in this same room and talk about all the issues that affect you over at the state capitol and on Capitol Hill. So here's a little sample of our first episode. The most important thing on the list is the fact that we have 53 new legislators out of 144. And a lot of people, uh, groups, institutions, whatever, associations feel that that's a challenge. Some people are overwhelmed by something, you know, a number that large, all these new personalities, you know. Uh, we see it as an opportunity because, again, we're back to education. We all know what tabula rasa means. Uh, you know, blank slate, these men and women, women come to town, some of them have nothing but a tomato plant in their district. So that's what you can expect every week during the legislative session. Now, finally, as promised, we have a new episode of the Louisiana Farm Life podcast, this time with Mushroom Maggie. Jennifer Finley came in this studio and they had a really in-depth conversation about what makes Maggie do what she does, and also how she got started in growing mushrooms in the first place. We knew we wanted to do something different. We knew we wanted to do something indoors. We could do it all year long. Um, so something we, that didn't step on the right, toes of those right. around you, which it's, is cool. Right. I mean, we so we went and toured farm to see what people were doing, what they were working on, and you know, everybody that was doing like microgreens and all that, they were doing it well. I mean, and then we just realized that the mushroom thing was, was it. And we just locked in there and just ran with it. To me, I cannot believe the information that is available, not only with your neighbors, but online these days. Oh, yes, everything that we initially learned, we learned online. The rest we learned from experience. We didn't pick this because we were obsessed with it. We became obsessed with it after we picked it. Cool. But um, it was just one of those niches, you know, one of the voids that needed to be filled and um, just to bring a whole different knowledge to the, the community that don't even know about it, you know. And so it was kind of just a calling at that point. If you haven't already, go ahead and go to wherever you listen to podcasts, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or you can just go to our website, twilatv.org, and you'll find links there. And make sure to listen to all of them, especially that latest Louisiana Farm Life. It is really interesting. And so, Kristen, since we're talking so much about podcasts, I'm going to go ahead and get things set up in here. You go ahead and finish up the show without me. I'll do my best, and I'll be in there in just a few minutes. Well, after a few weeks of not-so-good news, I think we can all agree that we need a much-needed uplift boost. This viral video from 2018 recently resurfaced on Facebook featuring Texas Sheriff Deputy Craig Brady rescuing a cow drowning in floodwaters during Hurricane Harvey. Come on, come on, girl. Let's go. Come on. Go. Let's go. Get up. Let's go. Get up. There you go. Get up. Come on, girl. Let's go. Come on. Get out of the way, There you go. Get up. There you go. Oh, she's tired. Let her lay there. Now, this video showcases yet another example of how disasters often bring out the very best in humanity. To watch this entire video, we posted a link on our website at twilatv.org. Well, that does it for this edition of Twyla. Be sure to join us next week when Jennifer will introduce us to some women she met at the Louisiana Women in Ag Conference. Until then, you can watch all of our stories online at twilatv.org, and be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram. You can also find all of these videos and more on our YouTube page, so be sure to subscribe subscribe to us there as well. For all of us here at Twyla, thanks for joining us. We hope to see you again right here next week.